Well, I guess I'll, I'll start by just saying thank you to um, all of the students. Thank you for inviting us. And it's great to be back. I want to uh, particularly say to Judge McFadden how great it is to get to do this with you. Uh, you know, we were classmates here. We realized we were speaking to decide, trying to remember if we were in any classes together. The answer appears to be no. Yes, but, not that we remember anyway. No, but the registrar is right here. We could go and <laughs> we could get an actual answer to this. But we certainly knew each other well in law school, and then uh, our career paths have intersected at various points, and now, oddly enough, find ourselves in the same line of work. And so, anyway, it's just a privilege to be back here with you, too. Well, thanks, Dan. And I thank you um, to Connor and the Federal Society. Um, really great to be back here. When Judge Breast and I were here, this was called the Fish Bowl. Is it still? Is this it still have? Yeah. So <laughs> back in the day, um, we had. I guess it was not um, uh, frosted windows, and so really, you know, you, you, when you were you would study in here, but um, everybody knew if you were studying in here or not. So it's kind of nice that they've they've added the the privacy glass. Right um, now that you say that, it has totally changed. Yeah, it, it used to be all windows. I, yeah. You have no idea what people get up to now in here without the, without yeah. the, the transparency. Um, so, yeah, I know you all have a lot of great speakers. Um, uh, Connor was telling us about some of the folks you've had coming in, and uh, including several uh, judges. Um, probably not too many uh, uh, alumni, though. And so I thought it might be fun if we talked a little bit about uh, reminiscences. Um, any highlights from your time at UVA, Judge Bress, you'd like to share with us? Well, you know, I'll say um, being back here is such a great feeling. You know, you uh, whenever you're back in Charlottesville, if you've spent time here, and I, I was on the four-year plan here, and so I, I just have such great memories of this place. And in some ways, um, I feel like it, it, it's sort of, if I look back on my whole life, it's where sort of life began again, because I, I came to law school, I did not, um, you know, when I was looking at law schools, I felt like I had a great feel for this one. I, I liked the environment, but I did not know a lot about it. I just sort of had an instinct that it would be a good place for me. And it was just one of those formative three-year periods of my life, probably the most formative three-year period of my life. Um, and it's great to see so many members of the faculty, you know, here who, who were our teachers, too, um, and get to see them. And just the education I got here, you know, I mean, that you go to law school to get an education. I really got an education here, and it served me really well. So it's, it's just a wonderful experience to be back here. What do you think? You, you're back here much more often because you live closer. Yeah, I, I live nearby. And uh, for me, you know, this is Valentine's Day week. I met my wife here, so, you know, love, you can find love <laughs> as well as a good education at the law school. Um, she was a 1L when I was a 3L, I robbed the cradle, mm -hmm. um, but we were both involved in the Federal Society and Law Christian Fellowship and the Honor Committee, um, and so um, I, that, that relationship certainly uh, gives a, a rose-colored tinge to my, my, my reflections. Um, I remember um, uh, Crim Law with uh, then Dean Jeffries. Um, that was, I don't know if any of you all have watched The Paper Chase, but that was kind of my paper chase experience of this incredibly brilliant man. I, there was one, one day where he uh, you know, walked in and had his briefcase and, and ostensibly couldn't figure out how to, you know, the briefcase was locked, he couldn't open it, and therefore couldn't get his notes. And she's like, well, I will just have to do this from memory. And then proceeded <laughs> to, you know, speak in complete paragraphs and uh, as, as if nothing, nothing was, had, had happened whatsoever. And, and the, the cold calling was really amazing as long as you were not on the, the, the opposite end of it. Um, uh, but, yeah. Well, was, can I ask you, when you were in law school, what were you thinking that you would do? Yeah, um, I wanted to be a prosecutor. I, as um, uh, Connor alluded to, I had been a police officer up in Fairfax County for two years before going to law school um, and, and really wanted to go. I was tired of seeing the prosecutor screw up my cases. So I came to, to law school, wanted to be a pr um, uh, prosecutor. Um, if you had you know, gotten me uh, late in the evening on Feb Club night, I might have in admitted to you I wanted to be a judge one day. 
Um, but really, uh, being being a prosecutor was was top of mind for me. What about you? You know, um, I, I did not come here with any firm ideas of what I was trying to do, um, and that's actually been kind of true generally throughout my whole career. I, I I found it a little easier not to s to set any particular goals because in some ways it made you looser and it, it allowed your career to develop in a way that um, left things a little more open. And so I guess when I came here I thought, well, I'll go back to California, which is where I was from. And I eventually did do that. It just took 20 plus years. I thought, um, I hadn't really given much thought to law firms. I thought maybe I'd work in a smaller one. I ended up working at Kirkland Ellis, which is not a small law firm. and that was. Um, that was how I, I spent my career and how I probably would have spent the rest of my career, but for this. So I, I, it served me well enough, you know, to not have a firm plan. And so if you're somebody sitting here saying, I don't know what I'm going to do, I'm, I can just tell you, like, these things have a way of working out and it kind of makes sense later. Along the way, there were people that you met, you know, who were kind of influential and helped you and they helped guide you. Um, but, you know, I, I found that um, one thing I liked about law school and what I like about my current job is that you're a generalist, you know, and so you're learning different things. And I guess I encourage you to kind of keep pursuing those different interests and not to be upset when you're interested in something that you thought you might not be because it turns out you can um, develop passions in areas that you, you didn't necessarily expect and you can find that you're good at something that you didn't think you'd be good at. And, um, and that can be helpful. So um, I want to get to talk more about your time at uh, Kirkland, but we've skipped over a really interesting part of your um, career, which was uh, clerking for Justice Scalia, um, of course, a hero to many of us. Um, can you tell us a bit about him and about what you learned about being a judge from him? You know, he was an incredible human being uh, in every possible sense of the, of the word. You know, he... Um, what I saw firsthand when I worked for him was the amount of work it takes to r do the analysis in a way that's clear and that's right. And that, you know, when you, of course, I had read things he had written when I was your age. You know, when I was sitting here in law school. He was, had been on the court for many years at that point. He'd written many things. Um, working for him up close, though, was where I saw just the craftsmanship of, of what he was trying to do and how carefully he was doing it. And that was just, for a younger lawyer to see that and to, to see somebody you'd always admire and to see them in action um, were, were, were things i never forget. I mean, he had one of the parts of his process which um, was uncommon, was called booking, booking the opinion, um, which would be when you're done with the, the draft and he had been through it, take every source cited, go down to his office, and read that thing out loud and check all the sites. And um, that was an enormous amount of work. You know, it didn't matter what it was. It was a majority, it was a concurrence, it was a dissent. It was the same process. I do that process too. It takes hours. And we called it booking because you'd physically bring a cart of books down and you would sit in the office and he had a little pillow sort of where he'd keep the draft opinion and he'd flip it over. And um, that was what it took to produce things at the highest level. And that, that was my takeaway, was just how much effort was put in. But of course, he had incredible knowledge about um, and, and understanding about statutory interpretation, about separation of powers. A and he had thought about these things and understood them intuitively in a way that I don't think many people had until he came on the scene. So that I think his contributions to American law are truly legendary and will be something that we're grateful for for many, many generations from now. Yeah. Um, I would like to ask you, my friend, you know, when you, one thing I've always admired about you is going in and out of government, right? People talk about a revolving door and I kind of thought it could be that way, but for me it really wasn't. You know, it was a one-way door <laughs> into Kirkland and Ellis and then there was no, like, no getting out of there, you know, but you, you, you did it, right? You were in and out multiple times and I guess I'm curious from your perspective, you know, why you did that and how you were able to do that. Yeah, this was actually a, a vision laid out to me uh, when I, my one L summer, I, I interned at the U.S. Attorney's Office in Alexandria and we had a, a brown bag lunch 
um, with the U.S. attorney, and it was literally a brown bag lunch. Those of you who've summered at law firms are used to these very fancy uh, dinners, catered catered lunches. No, no, no. At a U.S. attorney's office, you bring your you bring your lunch with you. But we sat around his conference table, and he he laid out for us this this vision of a public service, and and pointed to a lot of the top. Um, attorneys of our day, and he, it, m many of them are people who have spent significant time both in a law firm but also in, in public uh, practice. And um, his point was there are um, uh, skills that you can develop, uh, opportunities that you can have in public service that you can only have in public service. Um, but also there's training and, and opportunities in private practice that you would only get there. And so, uh, especially if you, you know, want to be trying to support a family and living in a place like DC or even, you know, God forbid, in like San Francisco or something like that, it is very expensive to, to do just public service. Um, and, and so the, the, there are also financial uh, incentives to do this kind of revolving door. And so that really captured my imagination. As I say, I've, I really wanted to be a prosecutor, but... How many cases did you try, jury trials? Yeah, um, I believe 26. I think I had 26 jury trials and about 50-some bench trials, most of those uh, misdemeanors. Um, so as, a, as an AUSA, I, uh, one of the reasons I did so many was because I was in the D.C. U.S. Attorney's Office where you spend much of your time really as a inner city prosecutor working in the Superior Court. That's the, the local court uh, doing very kind of local crime cases. I started off prosecuting possession of marijuana. I don't even think they prosecute that anymore. Uh, solicitation of pros uh, prostitution, um, assaults, that type of thing. And, and by the end, I was working on homicides. Um, and, and so it was a tremendous opportunity to learn how to be a trial litigator. Um, also, as I say, the you know responsibility of going into a grand jury, of um, making a decision about what sort of um, pleads to offer or how to to allocute at sentencing. Those those are responsibilities that really you can only have in, in public service. Um, but as you know, there are, you know, the, especially at a, you know, an amazing firm like Kirkland, there's training opportunities that you can have. Um, the, the, the caliber of the work coming out of these um, uh, top law firms, uh, it forces you to be better. It forces, I, I definitely, um, I, so I, I uh, spent four years at Baker and McKenzie after being in, in the U.S. Attorney's Office, and um, there, you know, I, I definitely improved as a, a, a writer, as a, um, a, you know, kind of a careful legal thinker. Um, also, there's something really um, important and, and special about having a, a, client who has a name and who is, you know, maybe his liberty is on the line, maybe they're facing a, a, a big judgment, but there's, there's a lot of responsibility um, to, uh, to that as well. Um, and and um, really to, to, you know, to be partial, to, to be taking a position that maybe you wouldn't agree with, but this is your client's position. And that's, they're, they're important skills there. Um, so I was really thankful for my time in, in uh, public practice or in, in uh, at Baker McKenzie. Um, my last uh, opportunity in public service be before I became a judge was as a deputy assistant attorney general in the criminal division, um, a uh, one of the uh, few political appointees in the criminal division, helping to oversee um, uh, the appellate section and the their kind of the white collar shop. Um, I, I, I love the management side of that. That's something that you know we lawyers usually don't get uh, many opportunities to to do, but but also to help set policy um, for the for the the Justice Department and their uh, criminal division uh, enforcement priorities um, to see the really important work that was being done by um, prosecutors around the country and and to help uh, encourage and and support that. Um, I think 
most most folks will probably get to spend some time at, at a law firm here, hopefully at least as a summer associate, which I think might be the only job that's even better than being a federal judge. <laughs> um, certainly more lucrative. Um, but maybe you could, do you have any um, suggestions, Judge, about um, what students should- You can should call me Dan, that's okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, what what uh, students should be thinking about as they're looking at different firms or um, uh, different types of practices they'd be interested in? You know, I became so knowledgeable about law firms, and that's not something I intended to become knowledgeable about, but I became very knowledgeable about the legal industry, which you all will too. And I think the, a couple things about law firms, you know, for one, I wouldn't be scared of them. You know, there, there, at least in my time, there was always sort of a aversion or skepticism of big law. I don't know if that still exists now. I think you have to know what you're getting into. Um, but I think they can be wonderful places to work. And it was for me. It was a great fit um, career-wise and personality-wise. And I say that for a couple of reasons. I mean, the work was really, really engaging and challenging. Right, that's just the bottom line. The work was hard. And th we had clients who had difficult, complex problems, and you got to work on those, and that was fun. In terms of when you're starting out and looking for firms, I think the recruiting process, I, I would not underestimate its importance, right? You know, a lot of times I would come down here to recruit, uh, you know, for my law firm. I would, I would be looking around trying to understand, well, who would be a good fit with us, right? Because there were a lot of talented people, but I could look around and say, well, that person's going to be a really, really good lawyer, but probably fit-wise, they're going to be a better lawyer at another firm kind of like this or that. Um, there's no right answer for law firms, but I think feeling comfortable within one with the, with the people there is really important. And so in the recruiting process, I encourage you to kind of get to know people, right? These The callbacks and trying to meet people, having follow-up phone calls, and you know, not asking questions that are ones like, you know, tell me about the pr trial practice program or something like that, but more asking them like, well, what did you, why did you come here to this law firm? And why have you stayed at this law firm? And to hear people's answers to that will tell you a lot, right? And I think um, you, you will become, uh, you'll, you'll go to do your summer associate, probably many of you will be summers there. And if you like it, that's great. You know, but if you feel like, you know, maybe it wasn't the right fit, that's okay too. And you can go back and reapply elsewhere. I think the key is to find a place, at least coming out of law school, if you're going to go from law school right to a firm, or maybe you go clerk first, you know, and then go to a firm. My thought is go to a place that you think you could see yourself at least two to three years, right? Just think about it. And it's hard, right? When you're, when you're in law school, that's a three-year period. You do a clerkship, it's one year. All of a sudden, everything feels like a job that's one year. But there is like the whole rest of your career, right? And so, but it's hard to imagine now going to a law firm and saying, I'm gonna go there and stay there for decades, right? I mean, it's competitive. You may not wanna do that. There's all kinds of things that can happen. You may move, right? You may decide you wanna go into public service. So thinking about it as like a three-year proposition, I think is easier, right? And then that three years can, can become extended. Um, but I found it more manageable to think in those terms because it's kind of hard to think about what you're going to be doing like in eight to ten years that's a long time from now one one plug I'd, I'd give is the importance of the alumni network um for for me going to baker and mckenzie one of the the practice group chairs was rich dean uva law grad he, i'd actually met him coming he, um speaking at law christian fellowship i think he may still do a j term class um but he was so helpful to me. But I think also just, you know, folks who are a couple years ahead of you, hopefully if you're 1L now, a 3L, you know, try to keep in touch with them and talk with them, a, a, you know, a year or two down the road, seeing kind of those, those experiences of folks you know or um, just, you know, other UVA alums who are going to uh, be likely to, you know, in my experience, very happy to have a cup of coffee with you or, or chat about their their experiences and um, at the firm and what it whether it be a good fit for you. I was going to ask you. Uh, this is kind of related about whether there was any kind of an inflection point in your career where you had to kind of make a call one way or the other, and you had to decide and and where that ended up going, whether it was the right call or not. Yeah. Um, so one, I, I, I guess, um, would have been uh, after being at AUSA for four years. As I say, my my wife was um, 
uh, is a lawyer. She had been at Sidley, Sidley Austin. By the way, this is the, uh, other than being a lifetime summer associate, the best option for a lawyer is to be uh, doing public service, but be married to a lawyer who's <laughs> at a big law firm. That, that works out really well. Um, but um, our, our first child came along and uh, she told me that she was done with being at a law firm and it was time for me to support the family for a while. Um, and so I uh, headed to Baker and McKenzie and I did that somewhat, um, uh, that was, you know, a, a, in some ways kind of a difficult decision. It felt a little like I was giving up uh, a dream of being a, a prosecutor um, long term, but it, uh, it ended up being um, the right move, certainly for our family, um, but also uh, really helpful for, um, I think, my, my career. Um, one of the things that I've, I've realized now, you know, in, in my current role, um, there are very few people like Judge Bress who are so impressive that they can just be at one place all along and go right to the, the federal bench. Um, most of our uh, m my colleagues and certainly most of the judges who have gotten on relatively early in life are judges who have um, uh, kind of leapfrogged around. And uh, for me, I, uh, there, there's no way I'd be a federal judge if I had just been at the U.S. Attorney's Office um, my whole career. Similarly, I would not be a federal judge if I had just been a white collar attorney at a, at a law firm. The, the entire way. Um, but my experience as a prosecutor gave me a lot of credibility as a white collar associate and I was able to get uh, promoted um, to partner um, uh, relatively quickly um, and then that position as a law firm partner gave me credibility when I was hoping to go into the administration back into the Justice Department as a uh, political um, official. Um, again, that uh, is something it would have been a m much harder move to make had I, um, um, had, had I just been coming um, uh, 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 from, the, from the U.S. Attorney's Office. So um, I think not only, and this is something that, you know, the, the U.S. Attorney really had not, uh, well, had kind of hinted at, but, but I think um, the law is, a, is an area that really in, often will encourage and reward um, trying out different things. And that, that's not true for, I think, a lot of professions. And, and it's um, uh, certainly something that I found that I enjoyed and, and was probably advantageous to me. Um, so obviously, I am a mere trial judge. Uh, uh, Dan Brass is an exalted appellate judge. One of the things we wanted to talk about a bit was um, the, the differences in, in our jobs and um, how, you know, even though, you know, both Article Three judges really how uh, very different our day-to-day -day experiences are. Um, the Ninth Circuit, I, I don't think I was aware of this until uh, the last couple of years, but I believe half of the population of America is actually within the Ninth Circuit. Is, is that right? It feels like it most <laughs> days, so. And they are all suing in yeah. front of Judge Bress. <laughs> um, maybe you could tell us a bit about your role as a, a judge on the Ninth Circuit. What does you know, a day in the life of uh, a Ninth Circuit judge look like? Well, it begins with a healthy breakfast. Um, no, I, you know, the Ninth Circuit's a fascinating place. It, it, the circuit, when it was put together, many of the states in our circuit were not even states. And I was looking, I gave a presentation to the Boy Scouts, uh, my son's Boy Scout troop the other night. And so I, I looked up how many people were in Nevada when the Ninth Circuit was formed. And the number was something like 25,000. Right, and now how many million people live in Las Vegas alone? So the circuit is diverse in every possible sense. I mean, geographically, when you're comparing, um, you know, Los Angeles and Idaho, these are just completely different places, right? There are different uh, cultures, they have different politics, they have different legal issues, they have different day-to-day -day issues that affect people there. And that has been something that has been truly impressed on me as I've done the work of, of our court. I mean, the, the work of an appellate judge, I think, is, 
is um, markedly different than the work of a, of a trial court judge. So obviously we're reviewing something, right? Somebody won, somebody lost, and that's now being positioned for our decision. A lot of times in, in private practice when I had appeals, you know, you'd be fighting about something at the trial court, and then the thing that was on appeal was actually felt sometimes like tangential to what the whole proceeding was about in some ways because what can go up on appeal can sometimes be a pure legal issue. So you could lose on a preemption defense, for example, just to give an example, and have a whole trial about all these other issues, and then all of a sudden it's back at the circuit at this you know preliminary issue, a uh, legal issue of preemption. Um, you know the day to day is basically, you know you're hearing, you have sittings right or calendars we call it. You're hearing arguments certain weeks out of the year. So I hear I, argument probably 35 days a year as in three judge panels, and then on top of that we'll have on banks which are full court. In our court, we're the only court in the United States that doesn't sit as a full court because we're 29 active judges. That's just too many, too many people to decide a legal matter. So we do 11, and so it's chosen by bingo ball. Everyone has their name on a bingo ball, and it's it's pulled out, and you see who's drawn for the embank. The chief judge is on every embank. So that's a highly unusual uh, process. And so I'll be drawn for maybe three to four embanks a year, I would say. And then on top of that, you'll have some other special sittings like death penalty cases are done on a separate calendar. So we have several states that have the death penalty. We treat those differently because they're a huge amount of work um, and present sensitive issues. And then you have some one-offs that, that, that come along the way. So days in the robe, you know, 45 days maybe I would say. And then the rest of that is preparing for that. And then, you know, once the sitting is done, completing the work of the sitting, which can, which is, you know, deciding the cases. And so the cases can be decided in two principal formats, right? We have what's what's an opinion, which we all know, right? That's a published precedential opinion. And we have what we call memorandum disposition or other, other circuits will have a different name for it, but it's the same thing, which is basically a decision for the parties. It's available. You can go on the website and see it. You can go on Westlaw and get it. You can even now cite it. It didn't used to be the case. You can cite it to in a brief. But it's not precedent that binds us in the sense that um, if something is decided by memorandum disposition and it, it, the issue comes back again, it doesn't bind us a as a matter of circuit precedent, but a published opinion does. And so the work of the court is basically trying to go through these cases, and we have a huge volume of cases. I mean, I think it's been as high as 16,000 a year. You know, you compare how many cases is the Supreme Court deciding a year, like 55, right? So that's just a tremendous difference and we have to have a whole infrastructure built up to try to process these in a timely way and to go through them. Um, but, you know, there's a, a huge amount of analytical thinking that goes into it, right? There's there's very few, I'm not on the phone with the parties, I'm not in preliminary hearings or anything like that. There is one oral argument, that's it, and the rest of it is kind of back behind closed doors trying to, trying to um, you know, issue a decision and, and or, or dissent, depending on what the what the case may be. Uh, it's it's law school. I think is good preparation for this because it's it's heavy analytical work and it's also cross discipline, right? So I came to the court with a background in civil litigation, class actions, major commercial litigation. I do immigration law, I do environmental law, I do criminal law, right? And I love doing these things because it kind of brings me back to why I went to law school in the first place, which was to be um, a student of the law, and that's that is a really cool thing about the job. Um, what we're missing, though, is is what you have, which I've always been jealous of, is the trials. And I guess I'd put the question to you: um, what what goes into holding, particularly a jury trial? You know, and I would say even more specifically, a criminal trial, because whatever your background, I think one of the most sensitive decisions we make is when people lose their liberty. Yeah. Um, and I guess I'm curious how you prepare for that and what that process has been like. Yeah, um, I, it's, it's certainly been a, a learning curve for me. It's something I'm very thankful I'd been a, a prosecutor and did have that trial experience. Um, um, I, I guess in my mind, a, a district judge basically was, was always in court and, and doing trials. And um, somewhat to my surprise then as a, 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 a baby judge, um, I, I really spent relatively little time in, in trial. In fact, my first um, four or five years as a judge, I'd only have two to three trials a year. Um, January 6th changed that. Um, we now have just uh, astronomically more criminal cases and therefore 
um, trials in, in our courthouse. Uh, last year I had 11 trials. So again, just you know, two to three times what I typically would have had um, prior to, to January 6th. Um, so the, I mean, um, I'll, I'll say it's a lot easier being a judge preparing for a trial than being a litigant. Um, that the, the, for um, me, what I'm um, most focused on is trying to resolve the pretrial uh, motion, there may be a motion to dismiss, a uh, motion to suppress evidence, especially in a, in a criminal case, that would be pretty typical. Um, maybe a motion to bring in 404B evidence. This is basically where the government wants to say, not only did the defendant do this really bad thing, but he's done five other really bad things in the past. And you've got to figure out if that is a, a, a admissible under the, the federal rules of evidence. Um, Sometimes you'll have uh, motions for expert witnesses, um, Daubert hearings, um, and, and so uh, depending on the complexity of the case, you could have anywhere between one to you know dozens of, of pretrial motions that need to be resolved at a, at a pretrial conference beforehand. Um, other than that, um, as, as you suggest, the, the jury trial, which most of our trials are, are jury trials, are um, have a added uh, component uh, preparing for the, the voir dire process. And, and voir dire ends up working pretty differently in, in different uh, courthouses. Our courthouse, um, generally the judge is, is really running the voir dire. I allow uh, the uh, parties to submit questions ahead of time that I'll ask the uh, panelists and then uh, depending on the answers, I may allow the, the the uh, attorneys to do follow-up questions of the the veneerman, but that's that is a, an, a, a emotionally and just kind of a, a taxing experience that that voir dire process. Often, I mean, one of the questions in any criminal case is, "Have you been a victim of or witness to a crime?" And um, at least in D.C., most people have been a victim of or a witness to a crime. Often, just like you know, my car was broken into or. Um, you know, uh, 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 shoplifting, something like that. But sometimes very traumatic and personal um, experiences uh, come out through that process too. And you've got to, um, you're, you know, you're kind of under time crunch to deal with this, but trying to uh, be with each juror and kind of humanely and, and also trying to evaluate, is this someone who would be an appropriate uh, juror for, for this particular case and, and be ready to answer um, uh, objections and, and, and really rule on objections um, in real time. Um, this is something us as trial judges have a little bit of, you know, kind of a chip on our shoulder when and then, you know, a year later it is reviewed by, by an appellate court in the, the, um, the serenity of the appellate chambers with, with all the time in the world and, and Westlaw at, at your fingertips. Um, and, and thankfully we, we are set up so that there is an abuse of discretion standard and, and I think uh, most circuit judges do recognize that those those split second decisions about whether to excuse a juror, how to rule on an objection during trial, that type of thing, those um, not only are being made in the heat of the moment, and you need to have a little bit of uh, grace for, but also that there are a lot of uh, intangibles going into that decision. Like, you know, if, when, if this person is saying, oh, I definitely can be fair and uh, impartial, but the body language is saying, oh, no, I can't. Um, that's not something that, that you know, is going to be clear on the appellate record um, two years down the road and, and is exactly why you have um, a trial judge who's making that decision um, in the flesh. Um, so the, the preparations, you, uh, and then the other big uh, preparation area is if, uh, the, the jury instructions. Um, those end up being very important, obviously, uh, instructing the, the jury on the law. Um, often those are pretty cut and dried. You know, if you have a felon possession of a firearm case, there's, can I can tell you right off the bat what the likely uh, instructions are going to be, what where, where they're going to be pressure points, and, and how um, I would likely uh, come out. One of the um, difficult things about these January 6th cases has been um, these are uh, 
uh, many of these are kind of charges that have either never been brought or rarely been brought and, and certainly not in this type of um, circumstance before. And so that's required a lot more research, um, a lot more time and, and uh, back and forth with the uh, parties trying to, trying to get it right to make sure that we're instructing the jury on, on the law. Um, because and and uh, you know understandably that is an area where you're not going to get a lot of deference at the the back end um, if if you screw up an instruction on the law and so um, that that takes a lot of preparation uh, during during trial it's um, often at the at the best it's like having the the best seat in the house for a really um, interesting. Uh, performance where you're seeing uh, thoughtful and well-prepared attorneys um, argue the facts and law to to a jury, and I get to um, be you know try to not insert myself and j just let the attorneys do what they're supposed to do. Um, sadly, you don't always have two great, well-prepared attorneys. Um, uh, and, and that then requires more involvement from the judge, um, especially in, in a criminal trial and especially in a criminal jury trial where you need to be um, really uh, careful to protect the record and to protect the defendant's um, constitutional rights even if the, the, his attorney may be um, dropping the ball here and there. So. Um, it is it is grueling. I think you you and I were talking um, earlier um, about you, you kind of being there, it, hearing um, oral arguments for you know a, a week and just how you're kind of drained at the end of it. That's that is that is certainly um, how I, I feel at the end of a, a day of trial. Um, although I also it's I I I, I love trial. I, I love trials. I, I I think it's just this. Uh, incredible engine for truth seeking and for um, justice being done. I, one of the things I, I, I find so interesting is often you'll have jurors who at the outset are clearly trying to get out of sitting as a juror and um, by the end um, they, uh, you know, I, I try to go back and thank them after the verdict and invariably they tell me how glad they are that they were a juror. And, and you know, for a lot of citizens, that is the, the most uh, direct and tangible way they will be involved in, in not only civic service, but in um, running our country and, and in a very real and important way for the, the individuals involved. And, and so um, I think it's, it's a really, hopefully, a, a, a usually a, a very positive experience for, for the jurors. Well, see, there's lunch, and I don't want to stand between it. I didn't realize there was a, a Chipotle and a Chick-fil-A here. I could have really used that <laughs> in law school. We did not have that yeah. down at the shopping center. But I think we should take some questions. And, yeah. you know, I'm always curious what's on your mind. We can ask each other questions all afternoon.